Hello and welcome everybody. You know who it is. It's your boy King Demps. Hang on. And you know what time it is because you clicked on the video and it had a title. We're doing ESL Pro League playoff predictions, but we're doing them as a tier list. Now, the reason we're doing this bad boy as a tier list is because look at all the pretty pictures and colors. That shit beautiful. Mwah. But also tier lists are fun. So, you know, screw it. Let's give this bad boy a go. And we're going to start off with Vitality. Now, when we talk about Vitality, we're talking about a team that made a pretty big change in the offseason, ditching Masuta and bringing in Spinks. And no offense to Masuta, but the guy was bound to go at some point. He never really developed beyond being anything other than a below average pro player. And he had some pretty blatant flaws. I think his biggest issue was probably as an anchor on CT. I think he really struggled in some of those anchor positions and was a real liability for Vitality in certain games. And they've brought in Spinks. Now, Blast was definitely an improvement, I think, on the previous Vitality showings, even if they didn't manage to make it through and qualify um, through the Blast Premier for groups. But they came to Pro League and they have basically swept the Board. Now, the big thing with Vitality is Zewu is looking back to his best. If we just take a look at the stats here, my man is absolutely balling out of his mind. Apart from Kay Serato, you know, shout out to Kay Serato, by the way, for his uh, his great showing. But Zewu is, is by far the best player so far in ESL Pro League. If we go and take a look at the leaderboards, we see my man topping a lot of the important bits and pieces. He's up towards the top of other bits and pieces, total kills, damage per round. You're basically seeing Zewu either at the top or near the top of pretty much all of the important stats. And when we're talking about vitality, Zewu basically needs to be a big player if they're going to be a team that's going to succeed at the very top. Zewu is their out and out star. Bringing in Spinks has definitely been an improvement on the firepower front. And I actually think if you look across their five, there is a good amount of firepower and impact that you can find there. And there's obviously a wealth of experience as well. Zewu and Spinks are the two less experienced players, and they've still got at least a full year of pro play at the top um, under their belt. Obviously not so much LAN experience for Spinks in particular, but either way, Vitality are looking just so much more well-rounded. So much improved off the back of this switch. And I think we're going to see a competitive vitality moving forwards. You can't read too much into the performance in these group stages simply because of the fact that we are still right after the player break. Some teams are still settling in. Obviously, they played in a group that was a little bit of a weird one. The fact you had three teams finishing on two wins and three losses. It was a bit all over the place, this group. Like, you know teams beat each other Na'Vi only won two series and it was the first two that they played um they lost to ninjas in pajamas who were terrible at the start of the group and then got a lot better so like it just in general group a has been a bit of a mess but you can't argue with vitality getting straight series wins only dropping maps to Fnatic and Na'Vi it's a good performance from vitality and when we're took taking a look at where to put them on the tier list yeah you've got to feel pretty good if you're a vitality fan right now now, coming back to the tier list and where to put them, you're automatically going to be putting them above uh, tiers C and D. They automatically have to, at a bare minimum, go in the jobs done category, simply because if you're going to march through the group stage with five map, uh, five map, five series wins, then there's not much that can be argued that you are um, at least above sort of these bottom tiers. You're not one of these teams where you're thinking, go, you were lucky to make through. Or one of those teams where you're like, yeah, you're not going to have any chance of winning a map. So this is where they go automatically. And actually, for me, they're going to go in the Dark Horses category. Vitality have the talent between Sphinx and Zero. That is a very, very potent star duo. And considering the other players on the team, when you've got Magix and Dupree, uh, Magix, Ma Magisk, Magisk, there we go. When you've got Magisk and Dupree on the team and they're sort of like the backup guys, your squad is probably in a pretty good position just in terms of fragging because Dupree and Magisk on their day can still do it. They can still frag well. It's not going to happen as frequently as it did in the past, obviously. 
you know, they're a little bit older as players now, um, but also the roles that they're taking in Vitality are different. They're just not going to be there putting up star numbers as frequently as maybe they once were on Astralis. And being brutally honest, when you're on Astralis, the best team in the world in like 2018, 2019, it's easy to look good, right? All of that shite being said, I think Vitality are going to be competitive in this playoffs. I think they're going to do pretty well in this playoffs. The fact that they're seeded straight to the quarterfinals means they already have a good shot at making top four. They skip one of the playoff rounds. And if we just go back and take a look at their bracket, I think looking at this bracket here, um, having either Fury or Outsiders, I think is a relatively kind draw. If we look at some of the other teams, I think Na'Vi would have been a scary one to be looking at. I think Liquid probably would have been a team to be looking at and thinking, yeah, they're pretty scary. And then obviously FaZe. I think of all of the stronger halves of these kind of quarterfinal or sorry, playoff round one matches, Na'Vi, Liquid, FaZe, and I would say Furia. I think Furia are probably the team you're looking at and thinking, yeah, they're the team. If we're going to get, you know, the predicted winners of playoffs round one, Furia are the team you'd want to get. So like I say, Vitality Dark Horses, I think they will make it to at the very least the semifinals. And then when they get here, depending on whether they're playing G2 or Na'Vi, those are, you know, I kind of predict Na'Vi to beat Heroic and then... I mean, this one's harder to call. Um, you would say probably on form from last season, obviously Na'Vi are the favourites, but with the way things are shaping up at the start of this season, it's hard to say. But yeah, Vitality will make it to the semi-finals, I expect. Could even make the grand final very feasibly with one of these matchups. And like I say, they're a dark horse. They're not one of the favourites. They're not one of the definite going to make grand final, going to contest for the trophy, but they're not far off. I expect them to do pretty well. Next up, we're talking about one of the NA teams, Complexity. Now, Complexity were part of Group C, which was one of the weirder groups of ESL Pro League in the sense that two of the favorites probably to make it out of the group stages take one of those three spots, Astralis and Ents. Neither of them made it through. And in the case of Ents, performed pretty poorly. Won their opening series against Heat, but did fuck all else in the rest of the group. Pretty disappointing. Astralis were a bit more competitive overall, but again, a bit all over the place. Losing to Heat is pretty disappointing. Losing to Complexity, probably a bit disappointing. But Complexity themselves, they came out all guns blazing. Going 2-0 to kick off the group was an incredibly big statement from them for a team that basically ever since they've put together this NA lineup under the Complexity banner, they have struggled to beat European opposition. They had a series win against Heat online but apart from that no series wins against european opposition at all ever since they put this lineup together so obviously the the leap in results has already been so dramatic since they removed junior and added Halzerk. the team itself doesn't operate too differently from how it did with junior in the lineup you wouldn't expect a complete revamp but Halzerk is so much more reliable the team overall just seems better balanced it feels like they were it feels like they were trying to cover for Junior's deficiencies, I've got to be brutally honest. Um, watching them play with Junior on the lineup, it did feel like he was getting babysat a lot of the time. A, a lot of the time, Junior was kind of stapled to somebody's hip and running around on the map with them. And yeah, it just it didn't feel like a, a, a workable um, structure, to be honest, looking at complexity before they added Halzerk. But like I say, since he's come in, it's revamped the team. Grim is looking really, really good. He's the guy who actually topped, um, if we go to the stats and we look at uh, the leaderboards, he's actually the guy who had the highest rating for complexity. If we scroll down, here he is with 1.15. Yeah, it's not like banging star numbers like some of the top players up here. But once you get outside of kind of like the very top performers, um, here's where the kind of golf happens, like a, a, a point... 05 disparity between Yekindar and Spinks. That's where the first kind of like really big, obviously, you know, Case Rata and Zewu. But outside of those guys, this is where the leap happens. So, I mean, you're not really far off, um, you know, some of the some of the better players in this group with Grim going 1.15. But just in general, complexity looks so much more competitive. Like I say, the team looks more well-rounded, more fleshed out. JT has been really, really good for complexity, a uh, high level of impact, and I think calling very well as well. The problem, I think, for complexity is moving forward. They've got phase in playoffs round one, so it's really, really tough um, for complexity to have much hope of getting through that phase game. And then if they do, they've got Cloud9. They have a really awful 
bracket. Like, FaZe are probably, you know, one of the favourites to be, like, the best team in the world for this next season. Um, early doors yet to say whether that's going to happen or not, but I, I would expect FaZe to have too much for complexity. And even if complexity did manage to pull off an upset here, going to the quarterfinals against Cloud9, yeah, unfortunately, I just don't see a way that complexity can get through even this first playoff round, but but quarterfinals. So, yeah, I don't think complexity are going to be going any further in this competition, to be brutally honest. Where to put them on this tier list? Um, if I was honestly going to like rank them, I would put them like like here in terms of what is is to do. So I think I'm actually can I rename this? Um, I'm going to rename this as um, as. Um, Hmm. What am I going to rename this as? I'm going to put them as upset possibility. Like they've got the possibility to upset teams in this category. Because jobs done to me, I would put complexity in a jobs done category because they've already outperformed expectations, already done enough to say like, look, we should be satisfied with our performance here and let's build on it moving forwards. Because I don't like kind of naming the category like that, I'm going to rename these categories and put them here. I don't think there's any possibility they upset phase or cloud nine. Um, but having said that, they've done really well so far. So fair play to Complexity. You're getting yourselves a little thumbs up from me. Next, the Russians, Cloud9. Cloud9 are a really hard team to gauge, right? The first half of the year, they were up and down. Obviously, they won uh, that FunSpark ulti finals. Not the most stacked event and online, but they won it at the start of the year to start the year off, right? And obviously, they won IEM Dallas. Outside of those two results, it was generally kind of shaky, like not the Clown 9 who set the standards in the first half of 2021 and were winning tons of events and stuff. Um, still yet to see that imperious level from Clown 9 consistently. I think their style got figured out a little bit. People talked about them having a very fundamental style um, on Cloud9. And, and what it kind of really translated to is they did rely on the on the basics quite a lot, on the fundamentals of Counter-Strike. There wasn't a, a huge strat book built on top of that, loads of complex strategies, loads of different looks. Cloud9 kind of, they take map control methodically. You know, they use their jiggle peaks and kind of basic flashbangs and such to take that map control. And they rely on that kind of default heavy fairly basic style a lot but it does work for them because they are good at the basics and they do them pretty damn well in this playoff group no pro league group that's the word i'm looking for they did really really well didn't drop a map until they played liquid at the end and to be honest this game was meaningless they'd already qualified and i'm pretty sure already qualified in first place no it obviously came down to whether fury could catch them on round differential um, but they'd already gone through. I'm not sure Clown9 would have been sweating too much over getting a straight court finals berth. But actually, looking at the uh, the draw that they ended up getting, I don't know, maybe it was important to top the group. The fact that they're in the same side of the bracket as FaZe and they've got FaZe if FaZe get through their opening playoff round. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Probably might have even been better to have not topped the group. But we'll we'll have a little look at the playoff bracket now. So obviously this means that they're going to have to play phase realistically and that is going to be a tough ask for Cloud9 but it's actually quite nice to see Cloud9 getting a really really solid team early doors because I want to know how to gauge Cloud9. They've obviously been pretty good, generally fairly comfortable in their series excluding that loss to Liquid. Um and it's actually been pretty refreshing to see a range of people performing well as well. Hobbit's obviously been good. Axile's had his map. Shiro is Shiro. He's probably going to always give us numbers and be a pretty consistent player. But even Inter's actually topped um, the scoreboards in one of their series. I forget which one it was. Let's have a look. Yeah, it was this series here against Movistar Riders. Inter's tops the board, performs very, very well. Um, but like I say, across the board, Clown9 have been playing pretty damn well. The individuals seem to be firing on all cylinders. And in terms of raw ability and skill, Shiro, Hobbit and Axile can all put up superstar level numbers and performances. I think Nafani on his day is a very, very impactful player, creates space. He's one of the more aggressive elements on Clown9 and I think very necessary for Clown9 where... Axile and Shiro can often be quite passive players. 
Um, and Hobbit is somewhere in between, but generally I think performs best when he's playing off of other things happening on the map. I think Nafani is really important to this squad. And actually, I think he is the linchpin. Nafani, not just because he's their in-game leader, but also because of the role he fulfills. I'm a person who's looking at Nafani to gauge how Cloud9 are going to do on a particular day. I think he is the key man, that linchpin that holds the team together. As for where to put Cloud9, they go somewhere either in the Dark Horses or the title contenders bracket. Now, I think the problem is is that when we're looking at this, I think we have to do this. And if I'm being fair and honest, because of the small sample size at the beginning of this season, we have to look to last season largely to kind of take our, our gauges and our predictions. Um, and so you probably have to say that FaZe and Na'Vi are on a kind of tier of their own. I, we will get to them and preview them a little bit more in depth, but just for now... I think it makes sense to say that the two clear title contenders are FaZe and Na'Vi. And so whilst on the form in the group stage, uh, you might say Cloud9 could maybe creep up into here. They look really good. They look really good individually. I think we have to put them in dark horses for now. Um, Cloud9 still have a little bit to prove that they can be the force they were at the start of 2021 on LAN. As in, on, at the start of 2021, they were winning all these tournaments pretty much all online, or in fact, they were all online. And now we're getting back to lands. Cloud9 are not quite the same Imperious Force. And yes, the land environment is going to have something to do with that. But also, I think once your streak is broken like that as such a young team, it's probably going to be pretty difficult to get it back to understand exactly what it was that made you so good. Um, and even to maybe develop your play and progress beyond what people have now figured out about you. So um, that's obviously talking about more so in the future for Cloud9. But right now, I expect them to be Dark Horses, and I would put them just a smidge above Vitality. I think it's very, very close between those two um, in terms of who you would say is more of a legitimate threat to, to win the title. Um, but I would say I'm, I'm just a little bit more sold on Cloud9's individuals overall. I think they have a little bit more firepower behind them. And so when you're looking at a newish team like Vitality, having brought Sphinx in, they're not communicating in their native language. Like, you know, we've got half French, half Dane, and then an Israeli thrown into the mix. I've just got to give that little bit of an edge to Cloud9. You've been together for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Cloud9, Dark Horse... Looking at the rest of this, probably going to be the top of my Dark Horses bracket or tier. That means next up, it's your boys, Fnatic, and my UK boy, Mezzi. Shout out to you. So, Fnatic started their group off uh, in imperious fashion. They absolutely spanked Nip. We take a look here. Yeah, this was an absolute... Uh, they bent them over. They bent them over. Um, and, you know, just smacked their body, nothing untoward, just a bit of body smacking, but it was pretty dire for Nip, really convincing stuff from Fnatic, Roy's popping, Fasher's popping, Nikados is popping, those are the three you want to see doing the majority of the heavy lifting, you want Crimson Mezzi to just be there providing that structure, you know, a veteran presence, hopefully some solid in-game leading from Mezzi. And actually watching Fnatic play, I was worried about Mezzi's in-game leading. And whilst I don't think he is necessarily there and a top tier in-game leader just yet, Fnatic have looked pretty good. They've looked well led. Um, their T sides in particular is something I've been looking at. And as you can see here, um, you know, 11 T side round on agents is pretty good. But also if we look at some of their other games... We'll take their loss against Vitality uh, as another good benchmark. And it was a pretty competitive series. They they won Nuke nice and convincingly. Nine T-side rounds on Nuke. Five on Inferno, not amazing. But, you know, they'd already kind of lost the first half and so were on the back foot. And then six T-rounds on Mirage. Again, already had had a 10-5 half. So, if anything, actually, in this series, it's their CT sides that let them down. But... Looking overall, like I say, the thing I've been concentrating on for Fnatic has been the T-sides, and they've actually looked pretty decent. I think when you've got Roy uh, acting as an entry, I think Fasher can be a fairly aggressive presence as a rifler. Uh, Nikados is definitely an aggressive AWPer. I'm not surprised that their T-sides are looking pretty potent with the personnel. I was just worried about whether Mezzi was going to be able to lead those T-sides, and so far it looks aye. Obviously, Fnatic had to kind of do it 
at the last minute by winning their final two games, but they did what needed to be done. They got themselves through. Actually, probably were overall the second best looking team in this group, despite losing to Na'Vi. Um, yeah, Na'Vi, shaky um, for sure. These three losses were, were not the best. And, you know, Simple definitely looking below his best, but we'll talk about Na'Vi when we get to them. We're talking about Fnatic now. So I like what I'm seeing from Fnatic. Uh, Basha looks like he's settling in. The team looks pretty cohesive. Beating Spirit and Endpoint and Nip. Okay, they didn't beat Na'Vi or Vitality, the two best teams in this group. But they did beat the rest pretty solidly. So yeah, it's good for Fnatic for sure. Because I want to spread these tiers out, a little bit i think what i'm gonna have to do is i'm gonna have to nudge complexity down to d um have for nike in c because i think some other teams are gonna have to go in this upset possibility bracket so the reason i'm putting for nike in here is because i just don't think they've had enough time together as of yet if we take a look at their bracket you would actually say it's not that unkind to them. Uh, I think Liquid's... It's hard to know exactly where Liquid are. I think this is actually going to be a really, really good series because I think we've got two teams who are on the rise um, with recent changes and, and are not there yet, but look like they have the potential to get to that kind of elite bracket and maybe be like a top five team. Um, Fnatic, maybe people probably would... Um, would like to kind of hold their judgment for a little bit longer because someone like Fasha, who's not had a huge amount of experience at tier one, um, Mezzi in game leading is another bit of a question mark. But whereas Liquid, a little bit more proven, we know Yekindar is an absolute fucking baller and one of the best players in the world. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a really good series and the playoff draw is not that bad. The fact that you have Maus, the weakest of the straight quarterfinals um, berths. You know, you're probably feeling pretty good if you're Fnatic. Like, you have a pretty solid chance of making it to the semi-finals. So I could actually, because of the bracket draw, see them making the semi-finals. However, when I'm doing this tier list, I think I have to put them in C because, you know, liquid their opponents. I know I'm I'm not putting teams in as I go here, but, like, I'm just putting them in when it makes sense to put them in. I, I would put Liquid as a more legitimate upset contender than Fnatic because I think Liquid have, they have a, a more solid core, right? Fnatic obviously revamped and rebuilt basically their entire roster. Liquid have a stronger kind of foundation to build upon or at least a foundation that was was further along the line, as it were, like they've been together for a lot longer, etc., etc. Obviously, Nitro, Elige, um have a lot of history together. Elise and Naf have been playing together for a while. OC's been there for a little while now and has had time to settle in. And when you've got Yekindar, Yekindar is better than anybody on Fnatic. Yekindar is, is just better than any player on Fnatic. Elise at the moment is, is really fucking good as well. Um, so yeah, that's why I kind of put these two as they are. Um, Fnatic, I think they're a good team. I think they will kick on this year. I think now is just a smidge too early. But having said that, I still would not even be that surprised if they did manage to beat Liquid and beat Maus and make top four. So I'm putting uh, Fnatic in C, but it's not a knock on them at all. It's just you've got to be fair and you've got to take uh, the whole sample size into account, not just looking at kind of what the team has done so far this season because it's such a small amount of games but also looking in kind of the broader, longer term. And so Liquid do have an edge. And that is just why between those two and using Liquid, who are their first game in the playoffs as a benchmark, it, that's why it kind of settles out the way it does. So we'll take a look at G2 next. So G2, on balance, if I looked at these groups beforehand, I probably would have said Group B was the weakest group. You know, for the win, guaranteed bottom feeders, MIBR. I like MIBR, but with their recent changes and losing cello and stuff, I would have said they were not going to be particularly competitive in this group. Big, a big, we know big have their problems, um, especially on LAN compared to online. Outsiders. I like Flit and I like Jame and I like 
their team, I think it, it can be decent. Probably isn't going to reach the heights of the previous Outsiders lineup because, you know, if we just scroll down and have a look at the lineup, there's just no way, you know, Jane Kick and Flit are the same, but, you know, there's no way you can, these, either of these two can match up to Yekindar right now. Even if I do think Fame and Norbert um, have shown flashes and fame in particular looks like he could potentially develop into like a really solid player but there's just no way either of these can replace yekindar and even looking a little bit longer term it's hard to be able to say with any degree of confidence that that either of these guys can norbert or fame can match up to the level yekindar was bringing Ended up just talking a bit about outsiders there, but whatever. This is a fucking... It's my preview video, all right? I'll talk about teams as and when I want. But G2, like I say, probably had the easiest group. However, they did just kind of tear through it. They just did just kind of tear through it. Um, this obviously is the most impressive result beating FaZe, and it wasn't even that close. Problem is, is that we never see the best of FaZe in group stages in this kind of play. This FaZe team, to me, has kind of made it clear that their modus operandi is going to be you see the best of us when the going gets tough you see the best of us in the crunch times in the playoffs in these finals in these semi-finals so whilst it is a good result and beating phase at any time is impressive this isn't the best version of phase you don't see the best version of phase at this kind of uh point in the tournament what has been super impressive uh, with G2 is I think they are looking so quick with their improvements. It feels like game on game and it feels like from Blast to Pro League, there was a very measurable improvement. The proof of concept I thought was already there at Blast, but now it's really coming to fruition. Hooksy was pretty fucking shocking at Blast, but he was so much better as an individual here in these groups. He actually had uh, a lot more games where he was in the positive um, versus no games. He, all of his games were in the red, a 1.0 rating or less in Blast, whereas he had plenty of games here that, that were got over a 1.0 rating. And actually, he was having some pretty good impact as well in certain games. He was having maps here or there where you're like, OK, if he can do this, be a bit of a Carrigan-esque figure, not going to be getting like mad frags and the biggest numbers, but going to have impact and going to have his maps where actually he's pretty important to the victory, then that's enough for G2. That's a brief of concept. The thing with G2 that's been bloody amazing has been the form of Monaces. Up here, 1.28 rating over 10 maps, just behind Nico. And if you can get these numbers out of Hunter, out of Hunter, out of Monacy and Nico, and then Hunter just needs to be the middleman, that like kind of third fragger. Like this team D2 looks fucking dangerous. If you've got Monacy popping, you've got Nico popping, that is a star duo that can go head to head with anybody in the world on their day. If you've got Hunter as the middleman, that next fragging presence, and then JKS and Hooksy providing the structure and just providing impact and experience and solid play where it's needed. Yeah, this G2 team, what we were seeing from the group stage was really, really, really positive for them. Like I say, the only caveat is a weak group. Now, they got a little bit of a rough and tumble bracket draw because I think they're on the stronger side of the bracket. Or do I even believe that? With FaZe and Cloud9 here and Liquid here. Navi, G2, Vitality. Yeah, actually, both sides of the bracket are pretty fair pretty fairly um balanced i would say but g2 are definitely gonna get one of the roughest quarterfinals draws probably probably navi will be the guys to get through this match although you know uh, navi were wobbly in the group stage we'll talk about them a little bit more later so i think g2 have a chance of beating navi honestly in this quarterfinals i think they have a definite chance again to the semi-finals if they do G2 versus Vitality or Furia, but I think Vitality, that'll be a really good game. G2 definitely have the chance to go all the way here and the chance to go pretty deep. And for me, they're going to go in my Dark Horses and I'm going to put them slightly above Vitality. This is mostly because I still think Vitality are a little bit reliant on Zewu. And all those Zewu who started this season on a tear and looks back to his best, and probably right now is the best player in the world, I would say. Because Simple, I think, is just since the player break has just sort of, you know, he didn't play all of Pro League and he's just looked uh, a bit underwhelming for his incredible standards. 
I think G2 have a little bit more depth in the fact that Monacy or Hunter or Nico. I don't know. I just have a little bit more faith in the fact G2 aren't so reliant on one player. And if Zeru just happens to, for whatever reason, have an off day, Vitality looks so much more less potent. Whereas I think G2 can cover a little bit more if, say, one of Nico or Hunter or Monacy has a bad day. I think they have a little bit more depth strength in depth in terms of firepower to to kind of recover from one of their star players having a bad day um and i prefer hooksy over apex calling so that's the reason i got g2 above vitality i think g2 are legitimate dark horses i think you could even make an argument for which one of these two you wanted to put but i'm going to stick with cloud nine that is where g2 are going Next up, we'll, we'll, we'll cover these guys all a bit more quickly, actually, because I think there's some of the less interesting teams uh, to talk about. Um, we'll cover them a little bit quickly. I think Heroic go in here with Fnatic. I'm going to put them slightly above Fnatic. I think Heroic... Um, let's have a look at their games quickly. Um, I think they did well in this group going 4-1. and one. Um, but I think this group ended up being a bit of a gimme because Astralis were were looking really suspect. Ents looked terrible and Heat weren't very good. So in the end, you kind of ended up actually with three gimme wins and all you needed to do was beat either Maus or Complexity to guarantee going through the group. So I don't think Heroic did enough to like convince me that they figured it out with Yabby in the lineup. Tessis looked really good um, throughout this this group stage, and he, I think, on balance, um, I would have considered him to have been their best player. If we just take a look at the leaderboards, I'm, I'm interested to see who actually was ultimately. So yeah, it was Tessis and KDN were the two best. Starvin's uh, wishy-washy form is definitely a concern because Starvin is the guy who a lot of people are saying he is like a legitimate top five player in the world in the future. Like he can rifle, he can orb, he's incredibly impactful, he frags. Um, he even seems to contribute a lot to Heroic's calling. So people are really big on Starvin and he was not, he wasn't terrible by any stretch of the imagination, but he just was, it's, it was almost like him and Tessus kind of swapped roles. Whereas Tessus has been kind of more of that like, you know, follow-up guy in the fragging and the carrying. It seemed like he was taking the forefront. And I'm never convinced by a heroic where Cadian is one of the biggest fraggers. Um, I think he can definitely do it against those teams kind of like maybe outside the top 10. But when it comes to the best of the best, I don't think you can rely on Cadian to be one of your biggest fraggers. So for me, heroic, um, I'm I'm still reserving judgment on them with Yabby. Um, I don't think... I think it was hard to know what to do with Heroic because it felt like the the five players that they had um, and their identity and stuff was all so carefully intertwined. It didn't feel like there was an obvious person you could like upgrade out of that Heroic lineup. In the end, what they did was get rid of Refresh, who was the worst performing player on LAN, but I just, I'm not sure with this Heroic lineup. I'm not sure. They seemed to kind of hit their ceiling, hit a stagnation point after the online period where they're always going to be sort of around that you know, they're going to be in the top 10 around that like number five region. They're going to be competitive, but never really going to be able to push beyond that. I'm not convinced we've seen enough from Heroic to say that they have shown me they have the potential to push beyond that kind of barrier, that stagnation, that plateau that they hit with the previous lineup. Uh, Maus, I am going to give them, um, I'm going to give them upset possibility just because we've seen the growth with Maus event on event um slowly oh why, am I, why have i gone here this isn't where i'm meant to be they've slowly um they've slowly essentially turned themselves into mouse nxt um we've obviously now got um where are they we've now obviously got jdc torsi and zershan from the mouse nxt lineup um so it's just, it's only Dexter and and Frozen who weren't, and their coach is the Miles NXT coach. So they've slowly uh, the NXT takeover has occurred. But in all seriousness, it is kind of bringing results for them. So I don't know how much you can criticize it. You can criticize each individual move and say, oh, you know, Bemis was treated a bit unfairly, or or MBK was treated a bit unfairly before that. But I mean, they're doing stuff, Miles. You know, they're they're doing stuff. They're looking pretty good. Frozen. Um, is back to producing some of his best play. And I think he is the man they need to turn into like 
alongside Torzi, their star player. Um, if we go and look at the leaderboards, um, you know, rating is just the easiest one, so we take that. Um, if we go down, we can see here JDC's the next guy. Torzi actually, yeah, did not have a good group stage by his standards, and Torzi in general seems to have just slightly cooled off with each event that Miles have played since he joined the lineup, or or there has just been a general slightly downward trajectory. Um, I think if Mao's are going to be as successful as a team, they probably don't really give a shit if Torzi is like going super ham. I think they're probably happy for Frozen to be putting up big, big boy star numbers. 1.28 rating is big. You know, the fact he's up there with like your Shiro's, your Mona C's and your, your Nico's, that's good signs for Mao's. Um, you know what? I don't think I want to put them in upset possibility. I think I want to put them right at the top of C tier. Like on the borderline, like my my gut tells me that Mao's probably won't make top four, even though they've got a straight quarter finals berth. And if they do make the semis against Cloud Nine or Phase, I expect them to lose. So I think I I, I have to go with my gut and say Mao's are going to sit here in this C tier, but. I wouldn't be all that surprised if they won their quarterfinal matchup. I think it would be a gr I think I think it would be a massive stretch to see them win a semi-final matchup against FaZe or Cloud9. Outsiders are the team I've actually watched the least, um, but I'm going to put them at the bottom of my C tier. Um this is largely due to a lack of information. Outsiders are the team I've watched the least of um, since their changes. What I have seen makes me think they basically just slightly downgraded. Um, Flit has been given a little bit more room to shine with Yekindar out of the lineup. Um, I think Flit and Jame are very, very good. I think Kicker is pretty solid as a middleman. I think Fame, from what I have seen of him, both when he was on K23 and in what I've watched from him on Outsiders, I think he has a lot of potential to grow. And I think we could see him maybe grow into a, a bigger and better player. But for now, I've just got to put him in C. Like I say, the the least um, I'm confident on talking about any of these teams, pretty much. And then Fury are going to take the last upset possibility although i very could very easily put them in the c tier furia k serato balled out of his mind in the groups and that was positive to see because he had a weak end to last season and part of the reason furia were kind of wobbling in some of these events towards the end of last season um i'm thinking of that um was it valencia where they went and were absolutely crap in that challenger event um and a lot of that was because Caserato really was struggling towards the end of last season. He was not the Caserato um, that we saw at Pro League who balled out of his freaking mind and, and was playing sick. Yuri had stepped up and kind of been that that guy to bridge the gap. It's always been Yuri Caserato on that Furia lineup for the, the consistent star players. But he had to kind of step up and fill the gap while Caserato was on holiday. Um, and we come to Furia now and what I saw from them at this Pro League. I don't know, man. Furia have the potential to look really, really good. And then they have the potential to look pretty bad. Um, I think Safe, I've got to be brutally honest, I don't think Safe is good enough. Um, he was not convincing at all last season. Come here at Pro League. He's had a couple of maps where he's looked decent, but in general, again, just doesn't really look good enough. And the first map I saw him play of Pro League, which I think was Furia's first official for like two and a half months, it literally looked like Safe hadn't played the game for those two and a half months. He was much better on the second map, but he was terrible on the first. I think it was Nuke. Um, can't remember which series it was, but um now, of Furia, the, the player I'm liking the most after K Serato at the moment, because obviously K Serato is incredible in this group stage, back to some of his best play, is actually Drop. I really rate Drop. I think he gets pretty much all the unglamorous roles on T and CT side. I think he has insane impact pretty much with all of his frags. He's one of the best anchor players on CT in the world. Like, he is so fucking good anchoring sides. And he's even pretty good on T side, just throwing himself out there, creating space. Um, usually get some damage or some frags off, but always create space and always, I feel like, does the right thing with um, his play. He, he, 
how do I say this? It's just his decision making, just the way he plays the game always looks like he's making the correct decision, always looks like he's doing what he needs to do to have the best chance to contribute to a round win for his team. I'm, I'm a big drop fan. I really, really rate drop. Um, so I'm going to put Fury in upset possibility because I think if they do catch a good day, they can beat pretty much anybody. Like they can be a fucking handful. But I don't expect them as much as I expect maybe Liquid to go for a deep run. Let's put it that way. Um, so I'm more putting Fury here based on what I think their kind of ceiling is. Not because I think their floor is particularly high. I think their floor is kind of low, Fury. I think they can suck on their day. Um, you know, they made a bit of a meal of that Eternal Fire series when, you know, really they probably should have put it to bed a bit, a bit, a little bit easier. But yeah, that's where Fury is set for me. So who haven't I really touched on? I haven't touched really much on FaZe and Na'Vi. Um, I didn't watch too much of phase and navi what i saw of navi was not very special and not very convincing and if honestly if it were just on this fucking tournament alone i would not have navi as title contenders the problem is is i feel like now that playoffs come around i think we're going to see a different navi and even a different phase because phase were in the easiest group and only came out in second but they got the job done they did what they needed to do um navi very very much were in danger of not qualifying out of their group and uh, I'm kind of putting these two here uh, largely based off of expecting them to perform much better in these playoffs. But I really, really, really could see both of these two not making the final based on their play in the group stages. Uh, it wasn't super convincing. FaZe obviously much better. And if I was, I would probably leave FaZe in here if I was to do it based solely off of this tournament. And Na'Vi would go like down here, you know. Um, but I think we have to acknowledge what happened last season we have to acknowledge that these guys haven't played any games with any real stakes as of yet and this playoffs and these playoffs sorry are the first time phase and navi are going to play where there's actually something on the line a tournament win uh, a big tournament win so i expect to see these two play more up to their standard um particularly considering navi have had some time now to work on stuff and i expect blade to have made sure that they whip themselves into shape. And FaZe also have had a bit of time to practice as well. And I think FaZe look their best when they have a little bit of time coming into an event to practice. That is definitely when FaZe look at their best. So I, like I say, I expect both of these teams to have improved by the time we get to these playoffs. And I expect them to be doing better than they both did in the group stages, but particularly Na'Vi, because yeah, they were, they were a bit shitty in the group stages, to be honest. And I actually ended up not watching a lot of either team because I was pretty underwhelmed with both when I did watch them. That's my tier list, boys and girls. I'm going to stick with it. Um, you could easily do this. Um, you could easily have, you know, outsiders maybe somewhere else because don't know a huge amount about them. Fury could easily go down here, but I'm sticking with them for now. You could probably rearrange the Dark Horses. I, I could be I could happily entertain arguments for any order, basically, of these guys, but this is the order, I think. And then I could totally entertain arguments with Na'Vi fucking being, like, down here based on how they were playing in the group stage. But this is what I've settled on, based both on the group stage play here, the play so far this year, but also, obviously, taking into account last season and... With these two particularly taken into account, I expect an improvement now that we're looking at some real stakes, something actually being on the line. Let me know if you agree, boys, girls, and otherwise. Um, I'm just going to put also a little... Uh... So this is my final tier list. I finally managed to put some, some letters on it. This one won't go on the fucking thing below. I don't know why. Don't ask me. But this is what I'm looking at. Phase and Navi S tier, Cloud9 G2 and Vitality A tier, Liquid and Fury B tier, Maus, Heroic, Fnatic and Outside of C tier, with complexity nestled in Lead D tier. Let me know what you think of these rankings, boys and girls. Let me know who you'd put in a different tier. I expect there'd probably be a lot of argument, particularly, I think, around the, the bottom of the tier list. I think there's a lot of people who probably argue putting Maus much higher, um, definitely higher than Furia. Maybe even some people who want to see Heroic and Fnatic put higher as well. I think this is, you know, these guys are, are kind of the guys you could definitely um, have, a, have a good talk about putting elsewhere. But let me know what you thought. 
You know the drill, like the video, let your friends know about it and comment. I appreciate all the support. If you didn't like this video, uh, then let me know why in the comments. You know, give me some feedback so I can improve. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.